Hey everyone, namaste and welcome to this evening's conversation with my good friend Kaustuk Desikachar, who is now Kaustubha Desikachar. So those of you who are listening in, please say hi in the comment section and please enter your questions as well. Let's make this as interactive uh, and as informative as possible. So my name is Shalija Menon and I have been a yoga practitioner and teacher for over 20 years now. I began my journey in Coimbatore, India with Integral Yoga and continued in Malaysia with my teacher, Manoj Kamal. Along the way, I set up my studio, Matt and Beyond Yoga Studio here in Malaysia. And I also published a book, Yoga Shakti, in 2018. And now I also host a TV show, Yoga Shakti, again with the Anand TV, which is based in the UK. So as you can see, the yoga practice has uh, truly shaped my life over these uh, last uh, 20 odd years. Now, I began these conversations uh, actually with uh, Kaustubha's prompting at uh, the beginning of the lockdown in 2020 as a platform to share the authentic teachings of yoga, as well as to share information about all the other great arts and philosophies in India. I would like to add that all these conversations are available both on our FB pages as well as our YouTube channels. So taking this opportunity to ask you all to, you know, take the time and just check out our YouTube uh, channels and like and subscribe to it if you like the content. Yeah, so uh, going over to Kaustub now. Uh, so Kaust, uh, I know he's uh, Kaustubha, but I just stick to Kaustub. As most of you know, he's a renowned yoga teacher, yoga therapist and author continuing the classical yoga tradition of his eminent grandfather. T. Krishnamacharya and his father, TKB Desikachar. Now, anybody in the yoga scene uh, will certainly have come across the name of uh, his grandfather, T. Krishnamacharya, who is considered the father of modern yoga and the revival of modern yoga is also to a large extent attributed to him and his legendary students who include Guruji B.K. Zayangar, Guruji Patabi Joyce and Kaustup's own father, Guruji TKB Desikachar. So just uh, saying hi to all of you who have tuned in. There's uh, a lot of uh, students and family here. My aunt uh, Indra, my students uh, Vichy and uh, Uma and uh, Kasuri, I think uh, is uh, also there. So just hi to all of you and uh, looking forward to your comments and interaction with us. Kaustu began studying yoga when he was nine years old under his father and began teaching by the time he was 13. He has a dual master's degree from the renowned Birla Institute of Technology and Sciences and a doctorate from the University of Madras. Kaustub conducts teacher training and therapist training programs around the globe, traveling eight months of the year to Europe, China, and other parts of the world. I guess this was in non-COVID times. He has authored several books too, and to name a few, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, To Serve With Love, a tribute to TKV Desikachar, the, the Yoga of the Yogi, The Legacy of T. Krishvacharya, and his most recent one, Truth Unclouded, The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. His objectives include the sharing of authentic teachings of yoga to the modern era and to build bridges between different healing modalities to promote physical, emotional, social, and spiritual health. So uh, just saying a few words about today's topic, mind matters, mental health, and its impact on holistic well-being. This is a topic that is extremely close to my heart, and uh, I know Kaustubh's too. And uh, it was, you know, just uh, just so uh, when we thought about this topic, it was it resonated with both of us very deeply, and we just both said yes. And uh, when we talk about health, the only thing we hear is diet and exercise. Yeah, these These are like the two main components for health. But uh, we all know, and especially as yoga practitioners, we become very aware that the state of our minds yeah, is really a very important component, if not the most important component in the state of our health. So uh, I believe these conversations are very important so that uh, the information gets uh, you know, widely circulated and we start looking at the mind to not in a negative way, but you know, as a means to greater health and wellness. So with this, I hand over the mic to <laughs> Kaustubha, who is busy drinking his uh, warm concoction. So maybe he can tell us a little bit about his uh, very interesting looking uh, drink. Namaste, Ammaji Shailaja. Namaste. How are you doing? 
So very nice to be with you again after a long break. I'm actually drinking a simple tea. Uh, it's actually very beautiful blue tea. Um, I think the tea is called uh, the blue pea flower, which I think in Europe they call it chakanka. So this is a very nice flower that uh, flower tea I'm drinking. So hopefully my mind will blossom to answer your very difficult questions today. So nice that you chose this topic today. So I want to uh, honor our conversations because we started it, I think, in March or April. Yes, it was the first one. And we are going on a long time. So yeah. let us hope that your questions today will not be so difficult. And if it is, my Chakaka will help me. I'm sure it will, Kaustav, though I doubt that you need any help to answer these questions. So I still remember once uh, when Kaustav came here to Malaysia and he was taking uh, classes some, you know, and I asked him whether he, uh, you know, prepares for his uh, teaching classes. And he said, very, very clearly, I remember that if he needs to prepare, then he shouldn't be teaching. So I think all of this information just simply flows out of Kaustub and he really doesn't need to prepare uh, for any of this. So with that, uh, I invite uh, Kaustub to uh, begin with his uh, beautiful chanting. Today I will do a chant to begin that is called Shraddha Soktam. Very relevant to our topic today. Om Shraddha Yagne Samedhyate Shraddhaya Vindate Habe Shraddham Bhagasya Murdhani Vachasa Vidayamasi Priyaga Shraddhe Dadataha Prayag Shraddhe Didasataha Prayam Bhoge Shuyajvaso Idam Maoditam Tradhe Yatha Deva Asureyasho Shraddha Mugreshu Chakrire Evam Bhojeshu Yajvaso Asmaka Moditantradhi Shraddhaan Devaya Jamana Vayar Gopa Upasate Agumradajya Yakutya Shraddhaya Hoyate Havehe Shraddham Pratar Havamahe Shraddham Madhyande Nampari Shraddham Suryasya Nimrachi Shraddhe Shraddhapaye Hama Shraddha Devan Adhivaste Shraddha Vishwamidan Jagat Shraddha Kamasya Mataram Abhishavardhayamase Om Shant 
शांत शांत हे नमस्ते Namaste. That was really, really beautiful, Kausto, and I'm sure our audience uh, enjoyed it as well. Uh, after the conversation, I usually talk to some very close friends, and they all usually tell me how much they enjoyed the chatting. So, thank you so much for that. So, let's just uh, begin. I'm really eager to go ahead with this conversation, and uh, let's just start with uh, health, right? So, uh, how do we define health, and what are the different uh, elements that uh, constitute good health? so there are many ways in which health is defined uh, by the vedic tradition in ayurveda there are some definitions in yoga there are some definitions etc uh one of the definitions since we are talking about today the role of mental health one of the definitions that is presented in the yoga sutra commentary by vyasa himself is dhatu rasa karana vaishamyam an imbalance in the physiological structures of the body the imbalance in what is called the fluids in the body and the imbalance in the sensory and mental faculties of the body so if there is an imbalance in the mind that is considered as an illness it's not just physiological illnesses that we are actually having that is one part of our illness that we have many different uh, types of illnesses as well my grandfather himself in the composition he wrote called yoganjali saram he says atmika daihika manasa bheda trividam vihitam yogabhyasanam there are three types of diseases spiritual diseases what is called atmika diseases daihika diseases that are the diseases of the body like we have diabetes back pain etc manasa bheda this is the diseases of the mind where we have depression we have anxiety we have so many variety some things which we can name some things which we cannot name uh, so these are all very much an integral part of health and it's no point in having a a beautifully balanced body but an imbalanced mind in fact i would even go to the extent saying that sometimes it's actually many times it's actually it's okay to have an imbalance in the body but not so okay to have sustained imbalances in the mind and i would say that if we have to address illnesses as a priority the mental illnesses would get a much higher priority in my view than the physiological diseases because in my experience of yoga therapy i've been working for about 25 years now i see that 95 to 98% of all physiological illnesses they have some psycho spiritual causes so if you remove the spiritual and psychological problems many of the physiological problems also disappears there are so many things like that which we can uh, correlate with so mental health is a very fundamental uh, factor and in which uh, it, it's also a very big contributing factor to overall health of an individual and i think that is why saying this today because there's also a big taboo about discussing mental health and we must not have that taboo there's a lot of people who think that uh, it's okay to have diabetes or cancer or diarrhea but it's not okay to have depression or anxiety actually they are all the same they are all different kinds of illnesses there is nothing wrong in having some kind of mental disorder and i can also say that in my experience working with people i have seen that almost all of us almost all of us we have we suffer from some kind of mental disorder at least for a short term in our life whether we acknowledge it or not certainly i have had my own battles with mental disorders like depression and anxiety but i also know that most people have had this as well and they don't discuss it because they think that somehow this is a taboo something is not right that's not right yeah not so right. Uh, just uh, in line with our conversation i'm just going to uh, see uh, ignatius uncle has written this uh, note as well that 
you know that india has the highest number of people suffering from depression in the world and how to how do we reduce the ignorance and stigma against mental illness like uh, i know kaustub is going to answer but i just want to say that i really think that these kind of conversations help like i think the more we talk about these things openly and the more that we accept that it's a part of all our lives like kaustub said he believes every person goes through it at different points in their life and uh, you know i really agree with that as well because uh, i also have had my own share of issues and um, through the yoga practice it has really helped me to you know come out of all of that so i think it's important we talk about all this and make it acceptable for people to know that it's all right to not be you know uh, you know on top of the world uh, every single day of your life and you know, it's okay to have ups and downs so conversations are important akal i think that's the way forward i fully agree with you uh, part of the thing is that we uh, we have made it like a subject uh, that we should not talk about or discuss about yeah. and i think this is absolutely wrong we have to talk about it because even in the ancient texts like yoga and ayurveda texts they talk about mental disorders i mean the patanjali's yoga sutra in my view is perhaps the first text on human psychology and it is much much more deeper than modern psychology there are so many beautiful concepts in the third and the fourth chapter that talks about psychological situations which even modern psychologists do not yet explore luckily i have had the experience to study both that i am actually enjoying that to see that patanjali has beaten uh, freud and his followers by at least 2000 years so yeah. talking about it discussing about it and not making uh, people who suffer from this shame that is the most important thing because we think that uh this means you have to be ashamed that you have a disease uh that's not right you can't you can't joke about somebody who has cancer you don't joke about somebody who has diabetes you don't joke about somebody who has uh, lost their leg in an accident or things like that the same way you must not joke and ridicule people who suffer from mental disorders so this is very very important that we consider it seriously as an illness and deal it with it as an illness it's that's it it's it's just something that we have to do and there is no shame in that my dear friends there is no shame in that because most people feel it and if you read ramayana for example rama goes through depression rama goes through anxiety so if really? rama go through that why not us of course if you look at the last section of the ramayana rama goes through a very profound state of depression and he goes and consults his guru vasishta and the conversation that we are rama and vasishta have is the first documented counseling session of psychology how vasishta slowly brings rama out of the state of depression because rama has by this time sent sita away from the kingdom because somebody talks about it and so he feels very lonely because sita goes while she is pregnant and his own sons are not with him anymore his wife is not with him and imagine he went to the forest 14 years and he fought the greatest demon at that time called ravana to win his wife back only to let her go how depressed he must feel so rama has suffered from depression so if rama our great god can suffer from depression why not all of us and we do the human being if you have a mind you will have a mental disorder yeah Not so i think yeah. one part of our body ever knows we have cold i we may have some eye pain or irritation ear some ear pain tongue we may have some ulcer hand we may have some uh, wrist pain but neck we have neck pain back we have back pain knee every organ has will is bound to suffer at some time mind is one such organ and it will be bound to suffer we just have to deal with it there's no ridiculing it and that is very very important it's not just talking about it it's talking about it with respect that's very important very true so there's dr ravi here who says that uh, he would say that the majority in the world are not spared from mental illness basically confirming what we've been talking about and that all of us somehow have some form of mental illness possibly and then uh, so there's a uh, rich kumar who says uh, can expectations lead to depression um <laughs> see it's 
it's so simple to it's simplify simplification that we can say that can expectation lead to depression expectation can be one cause of depression and what you have to understand is also especially in india we tend to use words very casually see feeling depressed is different from being clinically depressed see it's very normal for example <clears throat> that india is playing a cricket match with england today and if england wins and india loses it's very a lot of people are going to be very depressed <laughs> for probably half an hour or 45 minutes but that doesn't mean clinical depression see depression is a more heavy word that begins to affect the way we function in our life so we should not get confused with this so expectation may be one cause of depression it is not the only cause there are many fundamental causes and what i'd like to say in most of the cases in most of the mental disorders that i've seen the root the fundamental of all that is one very simple thing it's disconnection that's all and that is where yoga is so profound because the very word yoga means a union or a connection so yoga is the best antidote for these things because it's the exact opposite of what causes this situation so why do i say disconnection see if i am disconnected from myself i don't know who i am i try to be somebody else so this is what happens in most societies that's why most people are depressed because your mother may have one expectation from you your father may have one expectation from you your husband may have one expectation from you your wife may have one expectation from you your friends will have one expectation from you your daughter or son may have one expectation from you your classmates may have one expectation from you your neighbor may have one expectation from you your government may have one expectation from you and if you try to fit all of these expectation you will have not just dual personality what is called schizophrenia but you'll have a multiple personality disorder problem because you are trying to be different things to different people but as fundamentally you are not just yourself that's all in so many ways if you are doing a job that is not suitable for you that is not connected to you just because you want to earn money that will create depression you are in a relationship where you don't feel connected to your partner that will create depression for you you are living in a country or in an environment where you don't feel connected to the place you will have depression so fundamentally any kind of mental disorder comes from a state of disconnection this is very very profound because it is the connection that is the antidote and there is also a subtle layer as well why i say that mental disorders create physiological disorders and this is where the vedic tradition is so great in vedic tradition they say narayanat pranaha ajayata manaha sarva indriyani cha kam vayu jyotirapaha prithivi vishvasya dharini from the divine came prana from prana came mind from mind comes the senses from senses comes the different as elements of the body so if you work on the mind it will have a spill over effect on the senses and the body but if you work on the body it need not have the same it may i'm not saying it won't it may but it need not because mind is more subtle than the body sure in through the mind you are working from inside to outside rather than outside only so when you go to the gym and exercise you are only exercising the body it doesn't make you feel mentally at peace it's not a guarantee that's why somebody had asked a question about narcissistic personality disorder this is what most of our modern society is very self obsessed and does do not want to listen to anybody even if you go offer them help i myself i have gone to a lot of people recently to offer help in the yoga field as well but yoga also if you practice it in a certain disconnected manner 
will only create narcissism. That's why there are many schools of yoga, many ashrams of yoga, many traditions of yoga that teach standardized practices for everybody without making differentiation to each individual. They create more harm than help. That's why traditionally yoga was always what is called an anushasana, a one by one teaching. It's not mass teaching. Yoga should not be taught in mass. So what the teacher will teach one student is different from what the teacher will teach another student. There's no prescription for the masses in yoga, full stop. There's no this type of yoga, that type of yoga. All that is modern garbage that has happened in the last 30 years. You go 40 years before, there was no yoga type or yoga style. There was no styles in that time. Everybody called yoga only. So only in the last 30, 40 years, you have this marketing type that I belong to this style, I belong to that style, I belong to that style, I am freestyle, blah, 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 which actually is not really relevant. Traditional yoga, the way it is taught is like medicine. You will treat people individually. It's like going to a doctor, it's like going to a yoga teacher. You don't go to a doctor in group, right? The doctor does not put you in a group and say, all of you go through this medication. That is not how yoga is meant to be taught because yoga is fundamentally a therapeutic system because mind is the instrument of healing. Mana eva manushyanam karanam bandha moksha yoho. Last time when you were talking with the wisdom guy who kept calling you Amma Ji, I typed this. Mind is the means for either suffering or for liberation. If we use the mind in the wrong way, we suffer. If we use the mind in the appropriate way, we are healed. That is what Patanjali is trying to educate us. Hey dudes, please use the mind in the appropriate way. Don't abuse the mind because if you abuse the mind, you are abusing everything else. That's all. Okay, so I'm just going to continue with this uh, line of thinking uh, because uh, the next question really falls in with that. And uh, while we talked about you know the different reasons why uh, you know people uh, get depressed, uh, there's also my uh, student Dachani who says uh, when we get overstressed we get depressed. But again, like uh, Kaustup says, the Patanjali Yoga Sutras are really the key uh, scriptures which uh, talk about uh, you know the human being's mind in such a relevant detail. And uh, in that they talk about the kleshas and uh, you know what afflict the mind. So just going back to the sutras to you know give us a basis of understanding the mind and the different uh, afflictions of the mind. So just asking Kaustuk to go over the kleshas. Since you talked about my tea, I give another example of to answer to this question using the tea. So here I have my cup of tea with the chikanka tea. Now this is filled with pure water and tea only. Now if I put my finger in it, which is very dirty, what will happen to the tea? It will become dirty. dirty. <laughs> if I fill the cup with dirty water, the cup will be dirty. So the cup is like the mind. So what you fill with the cup, that is what will percolate to all other parts because that cup called the mind is encased in the body with the senses and other things. So if we fill the cup with noble thoughts, positive thoughts, then we have no problem. Whereas if we fill the mind with toxins, then the whole body and the other things will also be filled with toxins. Those toxins, they are called the kleshas. The mental toxins are called the kleshas. First and foremost, we have the greatest one that is called ignorance. I gave you that example a few minutes ago. I don't know myself. So, avidya is essentially lack of knowing the true nature of ourself. Avidya is not ignorance. It's only people who are not well trained will translate like patient. Avidya is the lack of knowing who the true self is. See, you are a woman, I am a man. You have some potentials, I have some potentials. I think some weeks ago you were in you were interviewing a, a fantastic lady called Vani, I think who was a great musician. She has that potential. I don't have that potential to sing. If I sing, I think donkeys will start laughing because that is my not my talent. My talent is maybe so, Vani's right here, so I hope Vani is listening to this. <laughs> She's here. Okay, Namaste, Vani, Namaste. Uh, so the, the 
different people have different potentials a cat has to be a cat a dog has to be a dog a monkey has to be a monkey so if we don't know what our true nature is what our true dharma is that is avidya that's why we suffer then we are trying to fill it with something else oh he is doing that let me do that oh she is doing that let me do that oh she is doing that let me do that that is not right that means we are filling something that is inappropriate avidya asmita the most uh, common one now especially in yoga field is ego we think we are greater than ourselves which is usually coming because in reality we think we are worse than ourselves low self esteem creates ego fear and low self esteem creates ego so those who have very high ego in reality they have very less confidence self confidence in themselves you must understand this so asmita is the ego where we have an inappropriate identification with ourselves either underestimation or overestimation like megalomania and things like that or lack of self confidence lack of self worth etc or false worth false worth what we are we we put our value somewhere else into something different that is what is called asmita the third one is called raga that is desire so desire is a very dangerous one because it's very tempting we like something we keep pursuing something again and again and again whether it is healthy or not this is what our modern problem is because we like something we want that we don't want what we don't like you take your facebook feed and my facebook feed it will only show what we like because we are following what we like the same with the news feed i go to youtube you go to youtube only what our past preferences whatever we search for will come so we don't know the reality because we have distanced ourselves from the reality so that is what is called raga we only want what we like we don't want to deal with reality so raga creates the fourth klesha that is called dvesha if you don't get what you don't like you have a hatred you have aversion you have anger you have the opposite aversion dvesha the last one very very fundamental is called abhini vesha fear and it's a very fascinating word because the word vesha means a mask abhini vesha means an intimate mask we all wear a mask we don't reveal our true self to others because we are afraid of what they will think of us right or maybe more fundamentally we are even afraid to see ourselves because we are very happy with the ego version of ourselves so abhini vesha is an intimate mask it's a fear fear which translates into fear of death fear of losing job fear of losing our family member fear of losing our job whatever fear it all comes from that so these five things we are filling in the cup obviously we are bound to have a lot of mental disorders on the other side if we replace these with clarity wisdom rather than have false ego false identity we have proper identity and we balance raga and dvesha we don't have fear we act from shraddha that's why i chanted this chant today shraddha soktam that is the opposite of fear we have faith not fear so if we fill those in our mind then we will not have all these mental and psychological disorders if you look at all of these psychological disorders they come from one of these five causes and their cousins the kleshas have their brothers or sisters as you want to call it their siblings which is basically patanjali calls it klesha vritti but as some people call it as the shat ripus shat ripu which is sariya those things are coming out of these fundamental five kleshas of which the most fundamental according to patanjali is avidya because we don't know ourselves we are trying to replace it with other things 
so uh, i think it's really important to know all this again uh, when i was first exposed to all this it's not just uh, you know you just think it's some words and you know something in the scriptures but actually if we explore each of this we can really start seeing it in our own lives and in our own minds yeah so at, at being able to identify it you know is like awareness right so once we know what it is that we're dealing with or what afflicts us then we're able to put in some you know opposite uh, thinking or you know like put in some more positive uh, way of looking changing our perspective but uh, otherwise we just flow with the mind right so that is why the knowledge and awareness of all of these uh, kleshas are so important so that when we look at our minds and when we are deeply afflicted we can see okay then we say okay so this is this klesha or this is that klesha and then we know right so that's just something that's afflicting us and we have a you know we have the means to be able to you know get past it by looking at the whole situation differently so can we just go over the shat ripus as well uh, kaustu just a little bit more in detail because these afflict all of us yeah on an everyday basis we are afflicted by these shat ripus so again like i think it's important to have the awareness of it correct having the awareness of it is important but that is not enough we come to that point later it's not enough that's the first first step kaustu <laughs> there's a concept called prajna parada you know we have the awareness but we still don't give a damn we just continue to do the same mistakes but at least we have the awareness that's <laughs> no, no, the first step it's a first step so the the shat ripus it's not shad it's shat p with a dot underneath shat ripus kama is the first one kama is like a perversion of desire it's like lust and you know it's so funny because you know we use uh, uh, for sexual relationship people use the word perversion of sexual sexuality as pornography but we have done the same thing with even food there are many many people who post pictures of food calling it food porn right so that is what is lust a perversion of desire we want too much at any cost at any cost and that is the problem and just think about it now you said to me before this interview started that you have a new dog right a labrador dog i love labradors but weimaraner is my favorite dog it's coming from the german city of weimar some of my german friends are watching they will call me now you have a dog right now do you give your dog will you give your dog coca cola every day no you won't right is the healthiest member of our house <laughs> but people give their children coca cola every day this is perversion of desire karma at any cost the child wants that coca cola at any cost but we won't give it to the dog we won't give it to the plants we don't pour coca cola to the plants every day we know it'll die but we do that to ourselves and our children do you really think coca cola is healthy no coca cola is an example things like coca cola you know so there is karma karma is not satisfied we get what is called krodha krodha is anger we get angry and uh, the anger can be passive anger or aggressive anger it depends on how we express it some people suppress it some people express it then comes moha when you get angry what happens you get deluded you don't even see where you are you don't know who you are talking to you scream you shout sometimes i see in my street some poor people fighting with their husbands or wives or children or whatever they scream they do things because they get blinded that is called moha delusion get deluded it's a very powerful state you don't know what you're doing see normally we won't beat our kids we won't beat our dogs but when we get angry we are so blinded that we do that not we not me but people do that humans do that this is blinded loba loba is greed 
you have things but you don't want to share we accumulate how much you are from coimbatore you said and you are still promised me to take me to have masala dosa in annapurna how many dosa can somebody eat at a time some metaphor which dosa is consumption how much can we consume yet we buy four houses 500 clothes five cars three telephones but we can only consume one at a time so that is loba we want so much greed that there are so many people with the need we don't want to share this is our fundamental problem with humanity and if you talk like that the dudes from america will say you're a communist that's not right it's just that it's imbalanced how much can somebody eat like if you look at animals they don't collect things for you know as a joke maybe for winter but not forever that's what we do that is loba then the aggressive form of anger the destructive form of anger that is called maga literally when you an elephant runs through the forest they say the elephant has maga what does the elephant do when it runs through the it destroys all the trees on its way it doesn't know what it's doing it just crashes into all the trees that is the destructive form of anger see sometimes anger is okay because it's it need not become destructive but when it becomes destructive that's where you have this domestic violence and all those kind of things that is mada rage and last is matsarya which is basically jealousy we don't have something but somebody else has my neighbor has a better car than me i get jealous my neighbor has a better job than me i get jealous maybe his child is doing better in school than my child we get jealous this is what is called matsar we get jealous of what we don't have we are not happy with what we have we are unhappy with what our child may have got 94% but the neighbor's child got 95% we are so agitated with our child we are not appreciating it for 94 we become jealous that the neighbor's child got 95% so that is what is called matsarya we have these kind of situations so these are all coming from the klesha because we are disconnected from reality whereas animals and plants they are connected to reality so they don't have this level of mental problems they have some but not to this degree yeah sorry just wanted to add that uh, this is so important which is why i uh, told kaushik to elaborate on it because we come across all these emotions on an everyday basis like if you even take uh, you know uh, jealousy envy all of this you just you know you see something on uh, facebook you see something on youtube right all of it afflicts us on an everyday basis so it's so important that we be aware of it and to notice it when it happens in our minds and you know, to deal with it otherwise those we sometimes just put ourselves in the bubble and say oh i don't feel like this other people feel like this or when we say you know anger or oh, i don't get angry only other people get angry and shout and it's not like that it happens all around us it happens in our own houses it happens in our own minds and what is very important is just because you don't express anger it doesn't mean that you don't get anger you are suppressing your anger it doesn't mean that you are not getting angry yeah so i just want to add one thing uh, on greed which is really aligned by uh, mahatma gandhi which always uh, strongly uh, strikes me where he says that there is enough for every man's need but there is not enough for one man's greed so i think that is uh, such a true statement and you know these days you know after the covid especially everybody become more conscious everybody even talks about the environment and you know what all we are doing to you know pillage the environment and when we look at it it's really man's greed that is destroying nature so uh, i think it's very important that we look into our own lives and you know i'm sure greed aff afflicts all of us as well at different levels so you know to see all of this and see how we can you know deal with all of this in our own minds and and i think that's why the earlier question you asked about the mental disorder
responsibility because we have created this society where we are always wanting more and more and more more is defined as success the more cars you have the more houses you have the more wealth you have that is defined as success the more material you have. this is a social problem it's not an individual only's responsibilities and it's very hard to think about it that's why i often feel that um, it's very difficult to fight mental diseases for example recently i'm working with uh, i'm dealing with somebody one young person who is living in a household where there are three other adults family members who are putting very poisonous negative thoughts in this person now just think about it this is a single person against three people so the strength that that person has to have to overcome three people they are living with is enormous now we can always say oh the person can always go outside and live alone no problem but it's only three people in the house but there's 300 million outside the house who are putting that same pressure when you ask somebody you know what when you meet somebody most of the time they are not asking they, are, they ask how what is your job absolutely they don't ask you are you happy if you say i am a computer scientist or whatever oh great but nobody is asking are you happy what do you like to do you know very rarely people are asking those kind of questions and that's why i say it's a social societal issue and we have to deal with this i agree with that 100% you're constantly judged by you know the amount of uh, students you have the amount of money you make and that material success is really uh, there's absolutely no talk about you know whether you're mentally in a good place or all of that doesn't have any value at all it's really a societal problem that we are only judged by a material success yes including how we are looking people are expecting us to fit a particular body shape it's not possible for everybody to be the same body shape how boring that will be then we will all become robots if we are all the same size same height same skin texture same color of the hair then we'll all become robots this is not possible recently i was going to a uh, a temple in sholingar uh, sholingar it temple it's called it's a mountain temple you have to climb the mountain and there are thousands of monkeys on the way thousands it is a very special temple all belong to the same species none of them look the same and they are not trying to be like the other monkey even though they are all monkeys but as we all want to go to the gym because we want to fit one particular type of shape because somebody decides it that's depression because you create this imaginary box that you try to fit you don't fit you get depressed and there are rules like that which are so silly which we will not do to the other kingdoms like animals and plants and that's why we are suffering yeah it is so true and it takes a lot of mental strength to really stand your ground and say okay this is who i am and you know i'm all right with it so uh, yeah so shanti uh, our friend uh, she says also that uh, she agrees with you about suppressing anger or other emotions because we want to be liked and uh, not be judged so she agrees she has, with that she has to agree she is born on the same day as me so she has to agree <laughs> all right so saying hi to dr balaji who has just uh, come here hi balaji and all of you are chin as well so nice to have all of you here and uh, i really hope you all are enjoying this conversation and you know, take away something uh, that uh, expands your mind from this so uh, this is actually something very interesting that uh, my son vaishnav actually asked me to ask you because uh, we were talking about this topic because it's you know it's really fascinating and uh, we always think of mental health as something that you know adults suffer from so he was telling me that a lot of his friends as well you know have uh, issues and uh, so he said uh, you know to just ask you why the youth you know have all these issues today and what can they do you know what would your advice be to them simple disconnection we are disconnected because of technology when i was growing up i was having this conversation as well with my daughter the other day when i was growing up at her age 
we had no mobile phone we had no television pro we, we had very few we had two television channel called doordarshan state and doordarshan national usually very boring so basically what we did was we were playing with the other children on the streets we played with them now when you play with the other children on the streets don't think it's just physical exercise it's a psycho spiritual experience because when you are dealing with other children like we had like 20 children in our street we used to play cricket on the streets every evening we used to play hide and seek we used to play so many other games football many things so you start to learn how different children are different how they behave in different circumstances when your team wins how they feel when your team loses how they feel and, you know and then you are also going into the houses of different uh, uncles and aunties you will see how if your cricket ball falls into the house of one auntie then she will very easily give you if you if it falls into another auntie's house she will be very angry that her glass broke and this so you start learning about how to deal with people you start seeing that everybody are different different from you you will have meals in their houses during the lunch break or break you will see actually these things whereas today we are isolating ourselves with a cell phone or whatsapp or things like that i see the younger generation now my cousin's children come to the house there are two brothers who are eight years old six years old sitting across the sofa and communicating through whatsapp or wechat or whatever program and that's the problem why do you think the ancient time the brahmin boys were asked to beg from house to house when you had to go from house to it was called bhiksha the the brahmin children they had to go a house to house and say bhavati bhiksha dehi bhavati bhiksha dehi it's not just to teach humility but it's also a social learning you see that every household the family structure is different the family dynamic is different the uh, the family behavior will be different so you learn and therefore when you do that then your mind becomes open your heart becomes open you are connected to reality of the society you are living in today we are only focused on what we like what we want if you don't like if you don't get what you want you throw a tantrum so that is not this reality that is why we are so disconnected that is why we are so disconnected and that is why we suffer from all this and young people have started suffering from this unfortunately much much more than we were and also i have to say the expectations of young people uh, uh, the expectations of parents or society on young people is greater now than before when i grew up my mother or father never even bothered how much marks i was getting or which college i was going to go to who my friends are who not my friends are i would i would and what i'm doing every sometimes when we used to go on sunday we would tell my mother and father i'm going playing cricket and then we will come back at 7:30 8 o'clock in the night they will not bother because they know we'll come back and everything will be okay the expectation on us was much lesser now the expectation is so much more higher because the competition is higher we want our children to get into the best schools we want our children to get earn so much more money and this and that and that is the problem and also the problem is in the old days the parents wanted their children to become what they were best in oh <laughs> this may sound a bit strange to some people but when you look at society now who are the smartest where are the smartest children being pushed to to study medicine law engineering computer science why because these are all what is called lucrative fields my grandfather's generation the smartest people were sent to study philosophy Okay. Now, this is the problem. We are sending the smartest people into things that are making us more and more disconnected, and the leftovers come to philosophy because they want a degree. So I was studying in Madras University for some time. 
the leftovers, the less smart people were coming into philosophy or psychology, which was difficult to understand for them. So to expect them to understand that is a problem, is a burden. The expectation for the young people to earn money, earn money, earn money, because it's a lucrative career, that's a big problem. So basically the and the rate at which information is coming, the rate at which information gathering is done is crazy. Now we are on internet, we can get millions of messages in the same moment. Whereas in the old days, there was a letter technology called pen and paper that would take 20, 30 days to go one way, 20, 30 days to come back another way. We only have to read a textbook. We don't have to read so many other things. Now everybody is just bombarded with information from so many sources. And that's a problem. So this is why the youth is suffering. And if we don't do something, our future is at big risk. Because these youth will become more sick who will be the leaders of society in the future. And they will have no clue what to do. And that's why we need to start young and deal with mental issues young and understand that they are under stress and give them support. Yeah, so uh, very well said, Kaustub. And uh, I think uh, I like that thing about start young. And I think it believes with it, sorry, it begins with uh, parents really, uh, like you said in the earlier days, really encouraging children to do what they're good at, like focusing on their strengths. So um, it's not an easy struggle because you are always thinking about the welfare of your child and you think that, you know, they have a good job, then, you know, their future is secure. And it's always that struggle between that and letting them pursue their creative, uh, you know, whatever brings them satisfaction. But uh, this is a very, uh, again, a quote very close to my heart, which uh, I believe uh, will resonate with a lot of people. It's very common as well. Uh, it's supposedly by Einstein. Now, I don't know how true that is. But it says that if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing it is stupid. So if children have forced to do things that they are not good at, then you know you really curb their potential. And they believe you know that they're not good at, you're good at it. Or like a kid who's not good in math, if you force them to do math, then you know they may be literary geniuses or they may have some you know real creative uh, capability but you know if you force them to do things that they're not good at then you just you know all their self esteem is dashed all and of that allow the children to be children right see i see in tv now when i watch the cricket there are advertisements that are coming for young children who are 6 years 7 years old to start coding in the computer it's called like white hat or something like that the children are coding in the computer when they're six or seven, not playing, not growing their mind, not growing their body, but they are doing some useless thing on the computer, which is useless because anyway, this app will be out of uh, date or expired in another six months because the program will be different at that time. So it's a whole scam. We are not allowing children to be children. That is the disconnection as well. So I think very, very uh, valuable content here, especially with regard to raising children. All of us have you know, young children. And I think it's really important to understand that we have to let them be who they are. And only then will they you know, be true to themselves and realize their, you know, their inner potential. I mean, Kausup's always big on this. And I really like the way he goes on about a cat can only be a cat and a dog can only be a dog. And you know, a butterfly can only be a butterfly kind of thing. But it really brings home the point that you know you can only do what you're good at, right? And you can only be who you are. So it's so I can only be Kausup and you can only be a magic. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to ignore the Amaji comment. Hey, last time the guy kept calling you Amaji, so I thought that was your new title. Okay, so I have Ignatius' uncle who says it is up to parents to encourage children in their interests. Yeah, parents should release their pressure. Very true, uncle, and allow some freedom to choose. Very well said. And thank you so much for your comment. So, um, I had actually many questions planned, but uh, we really have. Uh, gone over very few things and it's almost time up. I think it's exactly an hour now. So I'll just go with uh, one uh, last question uh, since uh, I 
have the ability to i don't see any questions so i can just ask my question so can you share some positive patterns that uh, you recommend to people or you know what you do as well in your own life that keeps your mind in a good space like eventually it's about cultivating these good patterns and uh, what what can we what do you do and what would you advise us what i have realized in the that has been the most helpful for me uh, and i talk only about personal experience is actually three things firstly where i had a lot of challenges mental and emotional challenges what actually saved me from that is chanting i'm not very good in chanting but i anyway sustained with it because the ancient chants they are all having in the sanskrit language positive vibrations that are embedded in them so when you are reciting those chants even if you don't know the meaning which i don't know for many of the chants the vibrations when you pronounce it correctly the vibrations become positive that's why i keep insisting on proper pronunciation so the vibrations will get converted that's why in our tradition they kept saying that do chanting a few times a day because it's almost like a reminder for you to kind of lift recalibrate your vibrations so true and that is one and every tradition as it christians have their chants the Muslim, islam people have their chants the buddhists have their chants the vedic people have our chants etc every tradition has this and so that is one thing that people can do the second thing that i find very useful is pranayama because breathing has a strong influence on the mind breath and mind go hand in hand and you can do breathing exercises anywhere you can inhale and exhale anywhere without anybody knowing this consciously you can inhale consciously you can exhale you know my my father used to do some pranayama during uh, some flights or some train uh, travel because no i mean you don't have to be worried about you don't have to hold your nose to do pranayama you can consciously inhale consciously exhale breath has a very strong connection to the mind this is the second thing i would recommend the third thing i would i i follow myself is follow the law of nature that's why i go to bed very early get up very early like what nature is doing spend time with plants animals etc in nature not always in front of technology not being addicted to facebook but rather go look at the tree look at a bird look at an animal just being there near water near the earth and how can do that in chennai i think many of you people who are living in much more luxurious places fortunate places can do i just hang around in my mother's garden that's heaven for me every day one hour i spend just walking around in the in the nature that's enough because that is a connection to nature i look at the sun i look at the birds i look at the neighbor's cat sometimes she comes to me i pet it so be part of nature sometime and if you can dedicate these things we are not investing in ourselves how can we expect others to invest in us think about it this way if i am not interested in me how the bloody hell can i expect somebody else to be interested in me that's what i tell my students you want to practice it's an investment for you it's an interest in you if you are not interested in your own well being and your own health how the hell you are going to expect somebody else to be interested in you that's not possible so these are three things i will say chant breathe and be as much as possible in tune with nature natural things when you go to the garden walk you don't need a garden just walk bare feet make contact with the earth that's enough stay away and if you do these though that time when you are doing this every day you are not on the computer you are not on facebook you are not on your telephone right 
That's all. Yeah, so I think it's really very, very good advice, Kaustu. I mean, I think it's really great. And uh, there's Erica who says uh, writing can also be very helpful. Um, I agree with that as well. I'm huge See, on journey. I told you these are three things. There are many ways you can write. Yeah, correct, you can correct. Sing, you can dance. Yeah. 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 So <coughs> sharing what is uh, being shared uh, here on the comment section. So, uh, yeah, so I think it's uh, really great to uh, have all these patterns, like you say, I like the word embedded, embedded in our everyday life and to truly invest in, you know, being the best version of ourselves. And it's only when we can work with ourselves and lift ourselves, then, you know, there is uh, any point in us talking about all these things and, you know, trying to share what we, you know, what we know. It's not enough to just know, uh, you know, intellectually, but uh, we truly have to uh, live that and express that as well through all our actions. So um, I think we should uh, start thinking about winding up this conversation. It's one I just wanted to say hi to my good friend, Sangeeta from Koyamoto. I see her there and saying hi to Priya, Erika, all of you, you know, thank you for being here. I truly hope you have enjoyed this conversation. And um, yeah, so Kausub is going to wind this conversation up uh, with a beautiful chant. And... Good. Well, somebody has just made a comment that it's basically about finding an outlet. I actually feel the opposite. It's about finding an inlet. Because we are so much outside of ourself, we need to find a way to go back into ourselves. That's what I mean. So let us do a small chant of um, auspiciousness. Oh. Karne Bishrono Yama Deva Padram Pashi Maksha Birya Jatra Irai Rangai Stoshtovagum Sastano Vyashema Deva Hitayadayo Swasthena Indro Vradhashrava Swasthena Kosha Veshwameda Swasthena Starksho Arishtani Vastino Brahas Pater Dadhato Om Shanti 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 Thank you, Kaustum. That was absolute beautifully beautiful one of my very favorite chants and uh, thank you all for being here uh, thank you for your comments thank you for your questions and uh, look Before forward to another conversation I, I forgot one very important thing yeah i think among among the other things that we can do to for mental well-being is actually a healthy friendship or healthy relationship if we can have people, very few people who are close to us with whom we can just be ourselves. That is a great gift for our mental health, well-being as well. We don't need a lot of people. We just need a few people. And that's enough. When I was uh, in my darkest era, there were very few friends who were actually by my side. That was enough. Very few. But that was enough. And that is what we need. A good, healthy relationship with friends or with a partner. One of them can help. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. And thank you, all of you.